Hi, this is Mary Vukisevic, and you're watching the surgical management of cataract part two. As with part one, um, this material is based on content created by Jane Farley. In the previous section, um, you learned about the orthoptist role in cataract management and also gained a basic understanding of IOL formulae and learned about the different types of IOLs available. In this section, I'll be giving you an overview of cataract surgery technique and you're going to learn about the potential operative and post-operative complications that a patient may face and of course that you're going to have to deal with as an orthoptist. Before um, the actual surgical technique starts, patients are given an anaesthetic and um, local anaesthetic is actually preferred to general anaesthetic because you don't need the patient to be completely asleep. Um, the exceptions are in the cases of children or if the, an adult is extremely anxious, perhaps if they're intellectually disabled, have epilepsy or a head tremor and so on. Um, topical drops are often applied or always applied and these are really good for patients on blood thinners and they allow for clear vision post-operatively. Sometimes a patient is given either a peribulbar block or a subtenon block. The subtenon block is not common. It's usually the peribulbar block that they'll be given. And it's where a 25 millimeter needle is given through the conjunctiva uh, and the skin. And you can see that um, the peribulbar block is shown on the left there. So if the patient is not given a general anesthetic, they'll usually get a peribulbar block together with topical drops. Now remember that cataract surgery is actually a sterile procedure. So everyone will be gloved and gowned and where in, in, in complete sterile processes uh, will occur in the theater. In the previous presentation, I, re I mentioned to you the old style cataract surgery, the extracapsular extraction, where a large incision is placed into the eye and the whole cataract is removed. That's very rare at the moment. Um, you'll usually see phacoemulsification cataract surgery and this is the technique that I'll show you in this presentation. It's when an ultrasonic device is used to actually break up or emulsify uh, and then remove the cataract from the eye and there's a nine step process from preparation all the way down to the completion and I'll go through each of these separately for you. So the first step is the patient preparation. And what happens is uh, firstly, betadine is put into the conjunctival sac and around the eyelids. And this is, um, you'll know this as povidone iodine, 5%. And this basically sterilizes the area. It's left in for three minutes and then rinsed out. And usually a, a drape is placed over the patient's face, making sure that there's no lashes exposed. And then, on the bottom image there you can see a speculum and that's used to keep the eyelids in place and to uh, prevent the patient from blinking. The next step in um, cataract surgery is the incision step and, and the incision is made by something called a microkeratome. It's, it's a blade basically or it can also be made by the femtosecond laser and the main incision is somewhere between 1.8 to 3 millimeters wide. So it's very, very small. And it's located in the preferred position of the surgery. So for example, it can be temporal or superior, or sometimes it's also placed in the steep axis of the astigmatism. Side port incisions or cuts are also made and um, there can be one or two side ports. They're tiny, 1.2 millimeters or so and they're placed at about 60 degrees to the left of the main incision. Um, something called viscoelastic is then injected into the anterior chamber to deepen it and this is step three, the deepening chamber step. Capsular rexus is step four and this is when a circular opening is torn into the fragile clear sac that holds the cataract. After this, um, the hydro dissection is performed. And what happens is fluids injected 
to separate the nucleus and the cortex of the original lens um, from the capsule so that the nucleus can actually, actually be rotated around in a safe manner. Surgeons will look out for something called a wave fluid as it passes through and that's when they know that that's been correctly separated. Step six is the divide and conquer step or the four quadrant divide and con conquer. And you can see there, there's like a cross in the, in the middle of the cataract there. And this is where you have sculpting of the nucleus to create a groove and then rotation of the nucleus to create another groove at 90, at 90 degree angle to the first. And then the nucleus is cracked into these four um, components. This is what they call the divide and conquer. And this is then emulsified, uh, so destroyed, and then aspirated, sucked up into that, um, into that instrument and removed from the eye. Cortical cleanup happens next, and, and the final remaining cataract material or the cortex is removed by a combination of fluid in and out of that anterior chamber area, and then you end up with a clear and empty lens capsule. Next, the intraocular lens is placed in. So what happens is viscoelastic goes into the capsular bag. Viscoelastic is a substance which is just like a jelly sort of substance. The intraocular lens is folded in half and, and it's inserted into an injector cartridge. And the tip of this injector cartridge goes into the incision area and it's gently then injected into the eye. What happens at this point is it will unfold into position inside the capsular bag and then it's dialed into position. Basically the surgeon will maneuver it around so that it's placed where he or she would like it to be. The ninth step is the uh, completion step and that's the final one and the viscoelastic is removed the jelly substance, as I said, is removed and aspirated away. Sometimes a little, a little bit of it can be left behind uh, after the surgery, but that's not that'll just remove itself. It's not a real big problem. Um, saline is then injected to swell and to seal up the corneal wounds, and also uh, an antibiotic is injected prophylactically. So this is to prevent any infection taking place. Some surgeons will use laser in the surgical process when removing a cataract. And femtosecond lasers have been used in refractive surgery for many, many years um, and have recently been adopted by many surgeons. And it basically replaces several of the manual steps of phaco emulsification with an automated process. The incisions into the cornea the capsular rexus and the initial fragmentation of the lens, as well as any astigmatism relieving incisions can all be performed with the femtosecond laser. Not everybody does it though, so you may not um, see this in your clinic when you go on clinical placement, but surely you will see this at some point in time. I'm going to talk now about complications, both operative that can happen during the surgery or post-operative that can happen after during the healing process. So let's have a look at the operative complications first. The first one is posterior lens capsule rupture. And this is often associated with vitreous loss and posterior migration of lens material. So the lens material just moves backward into the eye. And it can have flow on effects if it's not appropriately managed. So the patient can go on to develop CMO or um, cystoid macular edema. They can get a retinal detachment or develop endophthalmitis. The signs of posterior lens capsule rupture include a visible torn capsule, sudden deepening or shallowing of the anterior chamber and momentary pupil dilation. The nucleus can fall away and the um, phaco tip, which is the surgical instrument, can't actually reach it to remove it. Another operative complication is a suprachoroidal hemorrhage. And this is where you get rupture of the short or long ciliary artery and it causes uh, bleeding into the suprachoroidal space. It's quite rare um, with phaco emulsification. It happens in about 0.04% of cases, which is 
which is very unusual. The, the signs are shallowing of the anterior chamber, prolapse of the iris, raised intraocular pressure, and an appearance of a dark mound behind the pupil. The management is to fill the anterior chamber with viscoelastic and suture the incision, and the viscoelastic helps to raise the intraocular pressure and absorb the bleeding. Two more operative complications can be um, the posterior loss of lens fragments, where you get dislocation of lens fragments and they fall into the vitreous cavity. And these can um, then go on to cause retinal detachment, cystoid macular edema, an IOP rise. Um, if, the, if the fragments that are fallen in are quite big, the patient is going to need a, a vitrectomy. What can also happen is you can get posterior dislocation of the lens itself and it dislocates itself into the vitreous and this is the, the new intraocular lens that's it's being put in and this is quite rare. If um, this is not removed, that dislocated lens will cause a vitreous hemorrhage or a retinal detachment or macular edema or even uveitis. And basically the management here is the patient needs to have a vitrectomy um, with a, a, a new lens placed in where it should be. There are some other operative complications, but you know they're quite rare. I'm not going to go into those. Just have a basic understanding of these four. So let's now go to through the post-operative um, standard of care, and this is very important for you as an orthoptist. And this is what happens to the patient and what you are required to um, be part of after the cataract surgery. So at, um, on the column on the left, you've got the time after surgery. So the first one is one to three days post-operatively. And then on the right-hand side, you'll see the tests that are required with the orthoptist. So um, usually the next day after surgery, you the patient will come in and you will check their vision uncorrected, perform a pinhole test, perform an intraocular pressure test and check the drops that they're using. And this will happen in the operated eye only. Then the patient returns probably about seven to 10 days later for their post-op one. And again, on the operated eye, you'll perform uncorrected visual acuity testing, pinhole. Uh, you would do a quick subjective refraction, quick in that you wouldn't spend a lot of time refining it. You'd just get a general idea of whether there is a refractive error here. You, um, you know, we're presuming that they're going to be uh, emetropic for distance, and you wouldn't be prescribing glasses at this point either. Um, you and therefore you'd get their best corrected visual acuity, check their intraocular pressure again, and check what drops they're using. And then one month post cataract surgery, you would do visual acuity uncorrected. Uh, in both eyes to confirm what's going on in the other eye as well. Pinhole test, a thorough subjective because you may actually be prescribing updated glasses at this point. Best corrected visual acuity, intraocular pressure in both eyes, um, check what drops they're on and then they would have their uh, pupils dilated for a fundus check. If the visual acuity at this point postoperatively is reduced, then um, the patient would probably have either optical coherence tomography, OCT, or computerized video keratography or CVK performed to find out whether it's a fundus issue or whether it's a corneal uh, problem. Now, in terms of drops, it's really important that you remember to always check and document what drops the patients are on. And usually after cataract surgery, they'll be prescribed an anti-inflammatory in addition to an antibiotic eye drop. So, and that um, anti-inflammatory will often be tapered, especially if it's a steroidal uh, anti-inflammatory. I'll take you through some of the most uh, common post-operative complications that you'll see. Um, the first one is posterior capsular opacity, or a PCO. This is the most common complication, and it happens in about 5% uh, of cases and is somewhat dependent on the surgeon's technique. Younger patients ha can be more likely to actually get a, a, a PCO. And what happens is you get clouding of the posterior lens capsule from either growth or proliferation of 
lens epithelial cells at the time of the surgery. It's, it's termed a secondary cataract, but it's not a true cataract. It causes decreased visual acuity and decreased contrast, and sometimes even diplopia, usually monocular diplopia. Patients will complain of that, and kind of you, after cataract surgery, in addition to decreased vision, and you can almost certainly say that it's a PCO. It, this can happen months or even years after surgery. Um, the management is a YAG laser posterior capsulotomy. So the laser will just create an opening in the capsule and it's very safe and painless and it can just um, happen in the in the consulting room. The patient's is dilated and, and the YAG takes about 10 minutes to perform. Very easy. Some other um, complications that you can get are things like cystoid macular edema or CMO. And this is inflammation at the macular area which uh, causes blood vessels to leak and, and fluid accumulates around the macula. It occurs in about 5% of cases and causes blurred vision, of course, and it's usually treated with non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drops uh, in, in uh, cataract patients. Retinal detachments are another complication and these are quite uncommon, but um, sometimes do happen in extreme myopes. Some patients do develop uh, endophthalmitis, and this is an inflammation of the intraocular cavities, which is caused by a bacterial infection. The incidence is quite low, 0.3%. So it's really unlikely that a patient is going to get endophthalmitis, but still when the surgeon is consenting them for cataract surgery, they will be told about this as a potential risk factor. Um, some of the th problems Endophthalmitis can occur because of a few things. Either the posterior capsule has ruptured or the surgery has taken a long time for whatever reason or the patient hasn't started their postoperative antibiotics on the same day as the surgery. And the signs and symptoms are visual loss and pain and a swollen and injected, injected conjunctiva. It'll be really hard to see the fundus if someone's got endophthalmitis because vitreous haze will be present and uh, an inflammation of the vitreous. So if a patient calls up a few days after surgery um, complaining of reduced vision and a red eye, they need to come into the clinic straight away because the, the um, outcome of this can be quite severe in that they completely lose their vision. The management of endophthalmitis is intravitreal antibiotics, so injected into the vitreous cavity, or sometimes topical or oral antibiotics, and something called an endophthalmitis kit. There are a lot of a lot of clinics have an endophthalmitis kit on hand. It's already made up, so it's a good idea uh, for you to know where this is kept in the in the clinic that you'll be working at, um, so the patients can be given this endophthalmitis kit. How is um, endophthalmitis avoided? Well, basically, it's um, important to use betadine preoperatively um, and use it thoroughly to kill any germs that might be existing at the time of the cataract surgery. Uh, any pre-existing problems, for example, blepharitis or any other infection around the eye or the eyelids should be treated before uh, surgery commences. You can also use an intracameral antibiotic which is injected into the eye at the end of the case. And when I went through the steps, I said that one of those steps was to, to use this prophylactic antibiotic. Using antibiotic drops by the patient after cataract surgery is also important. And patient education, including um, using the drops regularly as prescribed and, and hygiene around the eye is something that the orthoptist will need to be explaining to the uh, to the patient. And also very careful review of patients during the post-operative period to look out for any potential signs of endophthalmitis. The prognosis will depend. If the patient presents with light perception vision, the chance of getting 612 vision at recovery of endophthalmitis is only 30%. If patients present with better than light perception vision, this increases to 60%. So uh, endophthalmitis is vision threatening and extremely important to look out for. 
Okay, so this brings us to the conclusion of part two. And in this section, we've covered the step-by-step um, -step, uh, surgical process in addition to um, post-operative care and also operative and post-operative complications.